implementing their civilizing mission in the Caucasian periphery, just to justify the annexation and incorporation of Georgia and the whole Caucasus into the Cyrus Empire. They attempted to integrate the different regions and social groups into a standardized modern national culture to provide a basis for a united Georgian nation. The Tabdayu levy did not want to secede from the Tsarist state because it protected, protected Georgia against Persia and the Ottoman Empire in its time. However, they were asking for cultural autonomy as regards to the use of their language. Russian universities continued to be a dominant, to be dominant places for the formation of Georgian national identity, as uh, paradox as it might sound. Since after the Tag Daliu levy, the next generation started to study more numerously in the period of reaction under Alexander III at different Russian universities. I won't go too much into detail of these uh, groups, but there were Marxist groups coming up. There were the young Iberians, so a more national-oriented one, uh, who tried to uh, create a basis, a common ground, uh, for their political actions, and also tried to introduce ideas of Narodnicheva, uh, um, so the um, people's movement or uh, yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in, in to transferred into the Georgian background but the most successful one in the end were the Georgian Marxists the so called third group or Misamida Selebi for political reasons this last group had to study medicine and veterinary sciences in Warsaw in the 1890s there the young western Georgian nobles met with Polish Marxists took up the demands of the peasant communities, suffering a lot from the land scarcity in the early 20th century. That way, they won the peasant mass of Georgian agrarian society for a Georgian metric version of the social democracy. I don't know, Tim, if you have referred to, to also to Stephen Jones' book on, on this. This is really uh, uh, um, yeah, very important. The Tab Daliulevi, in the meantime, continued to conduct cultural activities, develop institutions of public socialization instead of a traditional one. But the social cleavage between nobility and peasantry and the domination of the Tsarist state hampered the rise of a political loyalty on national grounds. The ethnic cultural community could not assume nationwide authority to counterbalance the power of rural communities integrated and led by Georgian social democracy on more or less non-national grounds. The national affair did not achieve this, uh, the self-organization of the whole society for regaining lost independence as a common ground, as it is called, Serto uh, Niadagi. The ambivalence towards Russia let them long for equality as Tsarist subjects recognizing their own culture and gra granting some degree of internal self-determination. Of course, we can discuss, discuss this afterwards, but I think this is a very, so very important for the setting. At the beginning of the 20th century, a non-existent political nation was substituted by a new ethnic sensitive community with cultural associations as its main <coughs> organizational backbone. The growing layer of marginalized, educated, white-collar workers with the sta same state of mind used them as a moral community, to use a term uh, 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 by Mark Steinberg on the Russian printing press workers, to meet and coordinate its efforts between Tsar and people enabling a combination of emotional impulses and rational control for their actions, this became an important school of Georgian nation building. This ethnic community required its own history, which was debated in the Georgian press since the second half of the 19th century. The temptation for the direct, the temptation for the direct use of history 
for the purpose of nation building reaches back to famous Ilya Chavchavadze, who stated, I quote, the prostration, debasement, and delusion of the nation begins at the point when it forgets its history, when it loses all recollection of its past. End of quote. Therefore, in the very first issue of the journal, journal Zakatvelos Moambe, Ilya Chavchavadze published in 1863 Sulchan Baratashvili's History of Georgia, thus creating a Georgian historiography in Georgia. In the second half of the 19th century, other Georgian intellectuals writing about issues of Georgian history did adhere to the necessity of strengthening national identity. For example, Dimitri Bakradze, Alexander Zagarelli, Ekstime Takashvili, Alexander Khakhanashvili, or Tedo Jordania. But did they also secure a critical distance to the object of investigation? This still needs to be investigated. At, the, at least Tsarist authorities were quite aware of this danger for the national internal cohesion of their empire. So the Russian head of the Caucasian Department for Educational Issues, Janowski, stated, I quote, I have to say that it would be more useful to, Russian, to the Russian state interests if such subjects as geography, articles and stories from the history of Georgia and geography were banned from the journals published in the languages of the indigenous peoples of the Caucasus, because such subjects can, in different ways, very easily, easily become nationalist weapons." End of quote. And now I'm turning to Ivana Javakishvili entering the field at this very point. So to the perspectives and his attempt to introduce scientific history writing as a cognitive strategy. Under this political drive for cultural self-assertion, a, a distinct national entity, Javakishvili, started his career as a professional historian. As a son of a teacher from a noble family in Tbilisi, he studied from August 9, 1895 until 1899 at the Armeno-Georgian Iranian Department of the Faculty for Oriental Studies, Oriental Studies at St. Petersburg University. His teachers were the famous Russian Orientalists like Zhukovsky, Veselovsky, Kakovtsev, Nikomar, Alexander Zagarelli, and Platonov, a very famous Russian historian. The academic study of Georgian history, culture, and language at this faculty ranges back to Marie Felicite Brosse's appointment as professor for Oriental Studies in 1837. In 1855 already, David Chubinashvili continued as the first professor appointed as the chair for Georgian language and literature, and then he was followed by Alexander Zagarelli. So what is very important here is that very early, Georgians themselves took over the research over Georgian language. All of them had to fight hard for the acknowledgement of the ancient historicity, mainly through the finding and publication of new sources. This was the preoccupation in, in the 19th century, what also uh, Marie Felicité Brosset did, so also translating sources into French to make them really available to the uh, scientific community in, in Western Europe as well. Already the choice of his subjects demonstrates his devotion towards the Georgian past. Georgian studies were embedded in this research tradition of Oriental studies in Petersburg. On Mars' recommendation about his, his erudition, the faculty decided in 1899 to prepare Javakishvili for a future professorship. Therefore, he expected the unique chance to make an academic career, what obliged him to adhere to scientific standards established by the Faculty for Oriental Studies at Petersburg University. After Nico Ma was appointed extraordinary professor in 1900 and ordinary professor for Georgian and Armenian philology in 1902, succeeding his opponent Alexander Zagarelli, the relationship with Javakishvili deteriorated, and Javakishvili openly broke with Mar. 
Java the, 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 the reasons for this break still needs to be uh, more closely investigated, but uh, it really coins it it's really with the perspective of uh, appointment of Nico Ma as an ordinary professor. Javakishvili lost his perspective for a chair and after his master dissertation in 1907 had to take up the insecure and badly paid position of a privat docent. Since the turn of the 20th century, Javakishvili pushed forward to adapt Georgian and Caucasian historiography to international standards. Already in his lecture, in preparation for his master dissertation on 18th November 1902, he stated that the main questions of the discipline, like the definition of the ethnicity, differentiation of racial and national markers, or the state, could not be tackled in line with international philosophy of history, as he called it. I quote, the research of each people's history depends on the science that is called philosophy of history and that constitutes the highest objective of our science. Therefore, with this quote, he was really in line with the positivistic approach towards history writing at the turn of the 20th century. But in his opinion, Georgian historiography was not yet sufficiently developed to apply the philosophy of history to the Georgian case. Therefore, he introduced the paradigm of scientific history writing as the leading principle in Georgian historiography to secure the objectivity of assessing the past, delimiting it from other uh, forms, example, for example, over patriotic purposes. At the same time, it restricts the responsibility for authoritative interpretations of national history to university-trained professional <coughs> academic historians. This is to introduce the Georgian nation into the European family of nations, which all possess, or should at least, their own scientific national historiography. And in that sense, introducing scientific national historiography meant opting for the European model of nation building and its standards. Processes of nation building, Europeanization and increasing <coughs> historical professionalism went together. So they cannot really be uh, 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 yeah, looked at separately, they are interacting. Europeanization and increasing historical professionalism ah, went together. Yeah. Sorry for that. Thus, the scientific history of writing needed to be separated from the interests and needs for historical orientation in practical life. In general terms, it meant that cultural science had to be established as a certain subsystem in society following its own inherent scholarly rules. In 1903, Jakob Gogebashvili, the founder of Georgian National Pedagogy, published his book, Burji Erovnevisa, the support pillar of nationality, where he, besides the importance of the mother tongue, ascribed history an important role for the individual's and nation's life, in particular for the deepening of national identity under the conditions of imperial rule. Only after the Tsarist annexation of Georgia, he holds his compatriots lost their self-activity, but Gogebashvili realized